Hello, everyone. You are watching the Econathon, a 24-hour broadcast on development economics from the World Bank Group. I'm Danny Clark, and I'll be here for the next hour of the broadcast as your host. Now, remember, we want you to be a part of the conversations. Go and submit your questions online. Now it's time to do a time check. So we are here at the end of our workday here in Washington, D.C. at 7 p.m. It is midnight in London and Lagos, and it is 7 a.m in Kuala Lumpur. Here's a quick look at some of the topics that we're going to be discussing in the coming hours. Watch. So one of the big topics that we work at here at the World Bank Group that cuts across all of our work is empowering women. From helping women participate in the workforce to protecting women's legal rights to supporting women in fragile and conflict-affected states. Our work touches on the lives of women around the world. I, as a woman working at the World Bank, I'm so proud to be here with four of my colleagues working on this issue. I have here Karen Grohn, who is our Senior Director of Gender at the World Bank. We have Rudaba Nasir, who is an expert on women's employment and childcare at the International Finance Corporation, IFC. And we have economist Jerija Borger, and Rita Ramalho, who is the author of one of our coolest reports, the Women, Business, and the Law Report, Welcome Women of the World Bank Group. We are here to talk about women's empowerment. Um, it is a deep and complex issue, but I'm wondering, Karen, if you can paint a picture of some of the challenges for women in the developing world. Uh, I'm really happy to do that, but let me f say first I'm really excited to be here and I'm really excited to be among my colleagues, uh, all of whom I have a great admiration for and really love to work with for a great team across the bank. Um, women in developing countries do face a number of challenges. Before I illuminate some of them, let me just say that there has been progress towards gender equality and empowering women over the course of the last uh, several decades. The Millennium Development Goals, of course, gave impetus to this, and there's been incredible um, advances in uh, education, particularly in terms of closing gaps in, uh, at the primary uh, school level in both enrollment and completion. Uh, we've made progress at the secondary level, although there's still issues with completion. Um, a number of countries are seeing reverse gaps, though, uh, where there is an issue of boys dropout, particularly at the secondary level. Um, in pockets of countries, there's uh, issues of maternal mortality. Uh, this is largely associated with poverty um, uh, and lack of economic uh, growth. It's a, a, a huge issue because we know how to solve maternal mortality. It's not seen in, emer in many emerging market economies and developed economies, but countries like the Sahel, unfortunately, still have very, very high rates. And of course, very high rates of fertility, which means that they haven't also been able to take advantage of a demographic uh, dividend. So progress, but still a bit of mixed picture. Um, the gaps that have closed in education have unfortunately not translated into the labor market and into returns to girls for their increasing investments in human capital. And we have a, a lot of barriers. There's um, a, a set of countries where women's labor force participation has, uh, has been very low. Women just don't enter. There's a set of, and those are countries, for instance, in the Middle East and North Africa. And you have highly educated women, actually more women than boys in some of the universities in some of those countries, but women are not going into the labor force. You have other countries like India where uh, female labor force participation has unfortunately been declining. Um, and once in the labor force, women tend to um, participate in jobs that are inferior to those of men. And of course, all of us here have um, had some experience probably with uh, 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 the idea of occupational segregation. Women go into sectors traditionally dominated by other women. Occupational segregation is correlated with gender earnings gaps. Uh, feminized occupations have lower uh, returns than uh, male-dominated occupations. Uh, women in male-dominated occupations do earn more than 
uh, women in female-dominated occupations, but I also have to say there's kind of a gap that men in female-dominated uh, occupations also earn less than they would in um, a male-dominated occupation. So it's very complicated. Um, and the final challenge I think that's really important, or two final challenges I want to mention are one, and I think they're related to the economic challenges, women are not yet uh, where men are in terms of holding positions of leadership and in, in governance. So, uh, of course, we tend to we look at it in, in governments around the world, in national parliaments, or at the local level. But even in the sectors where we work at, a world, at the World Bank, in the governance, for instance, of the electricity utilities or in uh, the transport sector, these are very male-dominated uh, sectors, and women are not in the, um, let alone in the employment, but also in the professional. Where decisions technical, are made. Where decisions yeah. are made. And the final um, issue that I want to touch on, which I think is a constraint to empowerment for both women and for men, is gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And we all um, have heard the statistics from the WHO that one in three women will be at risk of suffering some kind of violence at the hand of an intimate partner at some mm -hmm. point during her lifetime. And we know that uh, violence against women has economic costs, uh, including to uh, aggregate productivity growth, but it also has costs for firms in the form of absenteeism and turnover. It has costs to the individuals in the form of um, less participation uh, in terms of um, mental health issues. There's direct costs in terms of services that are necessary. And finally, there are intergenerational consequences. Children who witness violence tend to actually replicate uh, that behavior. That is a very comprehensive picture. I want to pick up on something that you mentioned about women being educated but not participating at the same levels in the workforce. So I want to turn to you, Rudaba. Um, you work at IFC, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. What is IFC doing to boost women's participation in the labor, labor force? Yes, thank you, Dani. Um, at IFC, as you know, we work directly with the private sector and various partners around the world to help women's economic participation um, as uh, employees, corporate leaders, entrepreneurs, suppliers, um, and, and consumers as well. And we do this in a number of different ways, uh, through business case research, uh, through direct client engagements with companies, advisory engagements with companies, uh, by influencing policy, uh, and by creating opportunities for peer learning. In fact, just uh, last month I was in Pakistan uh, where, uh, as you know, uh, it, it has one of the lowest female labor force participation rates in the world. And one of the main reasons for that is women's unpaid care and household work. So what we've done in Pakistan, we've partnered with the Pakistan Business Council and launched the country's first peer learning collaboration on creating family friendly workplaces. Um, in fact, we're so excited that 14 companies have joined us in this collaboration and made commitments to advance family friendly policies in the workplace, and these include childcare, paternity leave, breastfeeding support, uh, policies that are often not heard of in Pakistan, but the m momentum is there and the excitement is there. So now we just have to help these companies over the next few months in fulfilling these commitments. Um, from Pakistan, I actually went to Bangladesh, uh, where also we see a lot of private sector commitment um, around this. And IFC is supporting companies in Bangladesh uh, to actually understand the care needs of their employees and then put in place the right solutions to meet these uh, um, these needs. Um, so there's a lot of work that that, that is uh, ongoing with the private sector, has a huge role to play, as you know, in addressing um, these uh, gender inequalities. And while my colleagues are not here, I just want to quickly mention the work that they're doing as well, uh, particularly on women's access to insurance. So we're working with insurance companies around the world to help them design products that specifically cater to women's uh, unique insurance needs. Um, on the digital economy side, we're working with tech companies to create products and services that enhance women's access to jobs and assets, including core technologies. Karen mentioned gender-based violence. We work with companies around the world in Fiji, in Papua New Guinea, in Solomon Islands um, to put in place uh, measures to address gender-based violence and create respectful workplaces in which both men and women can thrive and be productive, as Karen mentioned, their productivity losses related to gender-based violence. Um, in addition, we also focus on women's entrepreneurship, um, uh, where we're uh, enhancing women's access to finance as well as non-financial services through our, we 
DeFi program, Women's Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative. Um, and also we've re released recently um, a report that outlines the gender diversity in private equity firms um, and funds uh, has economic benefits, business benefits, uh, they perform better. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done and uh, we hope to continue with the support of our donors, uh, including Australia, Canada, Japan, to do more in this space. Now, uh, I want to turn to Rita, is the author of the Women, Business, and Law Report. It's getting a lot of attention. This year's report got a lot of attention in the media, especially in light of the Me Too movement. Can you tell our audience what this report is, what is it tracking, and what are the findings? Hey, thank you, Danny, for that question, and thank you uh, uh, for uh, organizing this and for us to be here. I think it's a very important issue to talk about. Um, so as you mentioned, Doing Business in the Law actually this year had the uh, highest uh, um, notoriety across the world. We had the highest number of downloads than ever, and I think in part is because across the world people want to understand better gender inequality, what are the what are laws that prevent women from getting jobs, from maintaining jobs. So what Women Business in the Law does is actually that of measuring where does the law prevent a woman from actually economic empowerment and having an income. So looking at, at things from when she decides to join the workforce, impediments like being able to leave the house or being able to travel outside the country, but also when she decides to actually have a, a, a job, are there protections against sexual harassment in the workplace, in the legislation, also uh, job segregation that Karen was mentioning, also regulations that prevent women from working in certain industries that may be higher paid and then lead to a gender pay gap. Uh, and then, of course, if the, the woman decides to get married or to have children, what are the, the regulations that actually allow women to continue working even after uh, deciding to have a family? And, of, of course, also the being able to have and manage their own assets. So there's a lot of uh, regulations across the law that actually make it easier or harder. And so when we look at all across all these dimensions, there are six countries in the world that at least according to the law, they're equal. They still have gender pay gap like Sweden, but at least according to the law, they are equal. But then there's you know the other uh, 181 uh, um, that we do cover that they have some room for improvement. Some what, have, what are some of the most surprising laws on the books that are still on the books? So I think probably the, the mobility issues are still, so like there's very few countries that still have that, but where a woman to leave the house or to travel outside the country. So a woman that is already of age, so a 25-year-old woman, we need permission either from a guardian like a father or a, a husband. So there are still a few countries that have that type of... Uh, of restrictions. In others, uh, for instance, in the area of sexual harassment, which was one of the areas where we see much more movement in the, uh, in the past few years, it's also a lack of legislation. So it's not the l rules that are on the book that are, are anachronistic and no longer are relevant for today's life. It's actually no one has regulated this area that needs to be regulated. So sometimes it's also an issue of lack of regulation. And even things like uh, maternity, paternity leave and parental leave, which is also another area that we see a lot of changes uh, Recently, it's also surprising that there are several high-income countries that don't really provide paid maternity leave or paid maternity leave that meets an ILO standard. So, so, so some of those things were actually surprising. Uh, and oftentimes, it's actually low-income or middle-income countries that provide better, better benefits for w working uh, mothers. Have you seen how this report is affecting um, policy changes in countries over the years? And, and if so, how? So we have seen uh, across different areas, so some, some wor bank work, exactly, World Bank work uh, that actually uses uh, the data to inform their dialogue with countries and uh, their reform policies. So we've seen mainly in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there has been uh, uh, work in Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, to actually help them shape their laws and change their regulations. Sometimes some of these regulations may still be there from colonial times and they were never changed. And I think by measuring this, we bring awareness to the fact that they still have some regulations there that maybe they should rethink. Um, but also we see other parts of the development community using it. So the MCC Millennium Challenge, uh, Challenge Corporation also uses 
uh, the women business in the law data as part of uh, one of the areas that they measure when deciding to operate in different countries and to give incentives to different countries to actually change these regulations. Now, Garija, you have been working on a very interesting study uh, to evaluate the economic costs of sexual harassment. Can you tell us more about this? This is very interesting. Thanks, Danny. So, so yeah, so this is actually a subset of the broader gender-based violence, which is harassment that women face in public spaces. Uh, this is a major problem across the world. Just to give uh, you a sense of the magnitude of the problem uh, in Latin American countries, six out of ten women have faced harassment in public transit. And in Indian cities, 79% of women have faced some form of harassment in public spaces. Uh, so my study specifically looks at the educational costs associated with such street harassment. Um, and the motivation for this study was this simple observation that women uh, in, in Delhi University, which is one of the top universities in India, are choosing lower ranked colleges relative to men despite actually scoring more than them higher than them in the high school exams and you can imagine like high ability women attending low quality colleges uh, affects their academic earnings uh, their network of peers their labor market opportunities and also their lifetime earnings but just taking a step back and sort of linking it uh, to you know what has been discussed before, this is 50% of the potential labor force which is not getting the skills that they deserve. And this has implications for the entire economy through its effects on economic productivity. Mm -hmm. And what do you attribute that to women's um, lack of economic empowerment? Anyone can answer. What are some of the barriers that women face mm -hmm in certain places um, to participating in the labor force in a more present way? Well, I think on on average or, or generally, there's probably a few things that I think are important. I, th I think that we think that education and, s and lack of skills is really the problem, but I actually don't think that that is as much a problem. I think we've really closed education gaps and mm -hmm. other kinds of things. Um, I think the issue of norms are and mm -hmm. sticky norms is a huge issue, and and there are norms that men have about what they should be doing and what women should be doing. But women also internalize these norms, and these norms, I think, influence aspirations for what women can or cannot be. I think there's real issues like the kind of issues that uh, Rudaba mentioned and Girija mentioned. So mm -hmm. many countries, particularly in the developing world do not have adequate frameworks mm -hmm. for providing care, whether it's for children or for the elderly or for mm -hmm. the sick. Uh, and that includes uh, not only the quality of services and the accessibility, but the affordability of mm -hmm. that um, and the trust in the system. So we don't have systemic approaches. Mm -hmm. There's the problems of safety and security. Actually, Girija mentioned public transport. It's not mm -hmm. just an issue of safety and security, most public transport systems are not designed to meet the mobil differential mobility patterns that women have compared to men. They may take different, uh, they, have, they have different deviations in their day. They don't work nine to five hours. And, and the location of services, the safety of services, the timetable of services. So these are actually very uh, real uh, barriers. The policy and regulatory framework that Rita uh, mentioned are all important, but I think in the end, you know, we have to address, we have to do better diagnostics of mm -hmm. which challenges bite at what particular uh, points of time. And we have to really design around reducing, you know, these challenges, the specific kinds of constraints. And ideally in a country context, you know, we'd be addressing some of this in a multi-pronged way, not necessarily in the same operation, mm -hmm. but it, through a portfolio type approach. So let's talk a little bit, unpack a little bit more what the World Bank Group actually does to improve the lives of women around the world. Can, whoever wants to give us a flavor of that, um, I know we work in countries, we work with the private sector. Um, tell us, tell us more about Tell the audience more about that. Well, I'll, I'll start, but we do, and Rudava should join in. Um, we do a lot, and we're increasingly doing it in an aligned way between the public mm -hmm. and the private sector mm -hmm. that Rudava mentioned. So uh, we're making investments to help women access financial services. We are trying to overcome mm -hmm. some of our gender innovation labs are testing approaches to overcome 
unconscious biases of lending agents. So uh, wow. through you know n um, different kinds of scoring methods that could determine a worthy borrower. Borrower, if a woman doesn't own a house mm -hmm. or have a, a title to a land, it may disadvantage her in the cre in a credit market. She can't borrow from a bank. She doesn't have collateral. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to get around those kinds of barriers? So finding um, things like that. We do a lot on entrepreneurship that we mm -hmm. uh, other colleagues can talk about. Uh, we do a lot uh, with respect to, uh, now in the bank, I, I can't believe, addressing the prevention and response of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. What can we do more of to make schools safe and inclusive? When we work on strengthening health systems, do they have trained personnel to deal with trauma mm -hmm. and survivors of, of gender-based violence? Helping to understand the financing of those systems, the way those systems need to work. Um, so, um, and I think that we've seen a pivot, frankly, in the World Bank over the last five years in taking on specific challenges. And of course, we have the data and the evidence that actually helps to persuade clients to make these types of investments. And I think that's probably some of the most important things. And in the private sector? Yeah, yeah. And, and one thing that we're, I think, very good at is to bring different stakeholders together yeah. and uh, share knowledge, share expertise. So what we're doing, Karen mentioned that um, Care, care frameworks and quality and safety. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've pulled together a global working group of more than 30 organizations, including OECD, ILO, um, Lego Foundation, Oxfam, and we're co-creating for the first time a practical guide for employer-supported childcare so that employers can better understand what it means to offer quality childcare, ensure health, safety, hygiene, financial sustainability, um, particularly in countries where government support for childcare is limited or lacking. And we will be soon launching this practical guide in hope that more and more companies will be able to then implement it, uh, particularly where they lack this kind of guidance, and be able to support the care needs of working mothers and fathers by the way, care is not just a women's issue, Karen, and I talk about this quite a bit. It's a family issue. Yeah. It's a business issue. It's yeah. a political, economic issue. Yeah. Um, and we cannot sideline men in this because research shows, uh, research by Promundo and the Men Care Campaign shows that men are willing to work less uh, if they can spend more time with their children, if they're given the opportunities to do so. So I think engaging men in our work, in the uh, partnerships that we have, in the projects that we run, is, is a critical component of our success and even moving forward. And you talked about uh, norms as being key. And so how do, how do we change norms? How do you men? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start early. Yes. yes, start early with the with the yeah. child in the belly. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I think it's also by providing information, raising awareness of how one of the things that we've seen in women business and the laws, we look more at overtime data. A lot of the restrictions that women face in many developing countries now, they used to be there in the in the developed world, you know, 20, 40 years ago. So I think by explaining that, you know, these countries have been through the same thing and they've gained a lot by changing these regulations, changing these norms and making women more empowered and have them have more access because mm -hmm. otherwise you're just missing half of your population in terms of their productive uh, contribution to, to society and to the economy. So I think by bringing that awareness also helps in giving in people understanding that actually there's a can, an economic case for for women's economic empowerment. I probably know we have a, a lab, a behavioral lab oh. in the poverty global practice uh, called Embed. Now and within the development and then the value development chain. unit as yes. well. Mm -hmm. And I think they're doing some really wonderful work on how do you create nudges, particularly to get people to change behavior. Mm -hmm. And many of the issues that they're mm -hmm. addressing are issues of really regressive gender norms. So maybe you want to mention. Sorry, just one thing which which Something I think we are all doing. talking about is is the, which the bank does I think really well is also generate evidence mm -hmm. on what works yeah. and what doesn't and also how effective it is. So just linking to the uh, you know some of the work that colleagues from my team, the Development Impact Evaluation Unit, have done on harassment that women face. Uh, you know, so a common policy in response to that is segregation in public transport. Uh, so you know you have, for example, in the metro you have one in six or one in eight cars which are reserved for women who are 
almost 50% of the riders. Um, and then they show that in Rio de Janeiro, uh, like work based in Rio de Janeiro, that yes, having a separate women reserved car does reduce harassment face by 20 to 40%. Um, and women actually are willing to pay a lot to travel by that car. But an unintended consequence of that is that the women who travel in the public space, which they have to, given the restriction on, you know, I mean, the limited number, they're stigmatized. So they actually face higher rates of harassment we, in that. We could keep going for <laughs> hours, I know, and I'm so... This is, yes, this is amazing. I'm so proud to call you colleagues. We do have to um, quickly and this uh, great discussion. Um, any final words from you, Karen? Uh, well, I think Inspire that- Considering that there yeah. are people watching who are inspired young women. Um, uh, there's so much that we can do. Mm -hmm. I have to say, go online, um, use our data, Women Business on the Law, Findex, Enterprise Surveys, get motivated by the, the challenges that they, they're part of all of our responsibility to work on solving. I think Rudava said it. Actually, gender equality is all of our issues. It's not an issue for women. It's an issue for women, men, families, communities, societies. And we all have a responsibility for thinking out of the box and um, figuring out how we can invest a little bit of time and effort to make things better for ourselves and for future generations. Any final words, Rudava? I agree with Karen, as I mentioned, uh, we have to engage men and boys at a very young right. age in, in this uh, so that they grow up thinking that there's a quality of opportunity um, and, and everybody Thank should have so access to much. that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are going to turn now to hear what's happening on the conversation online, what you are saying online about this amazing conversation on women. <laughs> I am joined now by Fahir Alfayez, who has been following the conversation online all day, right? I Fahir? have, I really <laughs> have. And I've been engaging with a couple of you out there. I've been answering a couple of questions. So thank you for that. Thank you for, for your engagement. Um, I just want to say that was really an inspiration, just hearing some of our colleagues talk about uh, women's role, women empowerment. Um, that was really great. And I do, again, want to... Uh, point out our poll. If you haven't uh, done that, please do so. A couple of shout outs from Nepal, Yadav, hi Yadav, and then Lewis from Colombia. Uh, thank you all. Keep uh, uh, commenting and hashtag Econathon. Yes, so was, was there an uptick in the um, conversation just now, or you think everyone is uh, eating dinner? <laughs> just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> no, probably. I mean, at this hour in the United yeah. States, yes. People, yeah, watching us, eating dinner, and then joining the conversation. What else? Um, a, a great one. And, and honestly, I, I mean, earlier, Angeline said that she wanted, um, she looked forward to the Women Empowerment Session, and uh, she was watching it. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed it the same way we did. Thank you, yeah. Fahir. We'll be te um, checking in again later on. I'll be Thanks here. a lot. Thank you. So we have a huge topic for uh, discussion coming up. It is how do we measure poverty? Um, the international poverty line is assessed at $1.90 a day. Um, but is that high enough? And I'm here now with my colleague, Dean Jolliffe, to discuss this. Dean, thank you for being here on the Econathon. Oh, thanks very much for having yes. me. Nice to meet you, Danny. All right, so the World Bank actually defines extreme poverty as living on a dollar ninety a day per person. Um, why a dollar ninety? Can you break that down for us? Yeah, sure. So when we estimate the the number of people living in extreme poverty in the world, um, we need some value of a line to, to distinguish the poor and the non-poor. And and the way that we think about uh, figuring out what that value should be is we look to what's happening in the countries. And so we know that most countries in the world carry out household surveys where they go to thousands of households in their countries and they ask them, they have long conversations with them essentially or interviews where they're asking them what they consume, where they live, 
essentially what their life is like. And then they use all that information that they collect from these uh, surveys and they try to estimate, well, how much does it cost to meet basic needs in our country? Mm -hmm. And so all countries of the world construct national poverty lines. And we look to that information to say, well, what on average does it cost to meet basic needs in some of the poorest countries of the world? And when we look to that, that's how we find the $1.90 line. So it's really sort of steeped in decisions that have been made at the, at the country level. We, we think there are two really sort of useful um, benefits to thinking about it that way. The first is that by defining this in terms of what it means to meet basic needs in the poorest countries of the world, well, if that's what it costs to meet basic needs there, then certainly it costs at least that much in upper middle income countries or richer countries. And so in that sense, we think of this as defining extreme poverty in the world. And then the other advantage to this is that it's, it's not a line that's constructed in someone's office in Europe or in someone's office in the United States. It's really a line that is sort of respectful of decisions that have been made at the, at the country level. And so that's where that $1.90 line comes from. But has the World Bank always used the dollar ninety? I, I believe it changed in recent years. Can yeah. you explain why and what went into that change? Yeah, so it it did change a, a few years ago. It it increased from a dollar twenty five to a dollar ninety, and in fact, ever since we first started doing this, maybe about thirty years ago in the early nineteen nineties, it was about a dollar a day that it had as a as its value, and it's increased at uh, at several different points in time. And um, what's, what's important to recognize is that while that value has been increasing over time, the value that it is defining or the way that it's being constructed has stayed constant over time. So it's always been based on essentially typical poverty lines from, from poor countries in the world. And so that definition of how much does it cost to meet basic needs is essentially there our intention has been to keep that constant over time and not the value. So it's a lot like how um, with inflation in a country, a dollar today um, uh, buys uh, less than it did 30 years ago. And so for that same reason, that national poverty line has been increasing over time to ensure that that standard of meeting basic needs is, is essentially comparable over time. So there are different poverty lines then. There's the extreme poverty line and then you said national poverty lines. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so the, the, um, the focus of the vast majority of the work that we do in, in countries is really working with them on trying to solve their issues of, of national poverty. And, and when we're dealing with that, we really wanna make sure that we're working within the confines of, of how they have conceptualized poverty. And so we'll always use national poverty lines in, in these kind of cases. But we also have this mandate to monitor what's been happening to extreme poverty in the world. So people need to know what country, in what countries is poverty the worst? Where do we need to devote more um, assistance? Where do we need to sort of devote more efforts to try to eliminate poverty? And so for that effort, we need to be trying to count up, we need to be trying to construct a measure of global poverty with a measure that's sort of comparable across countries. So where is poverty the worst? What, what does the research tell us? What does the, using the poverty line, where do we need to focus efforts? Yep, so um, um, we have recently released a report in 2018, uh, the Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report. And, and um, one of the clear messages of that report is that um, this goal of eradicating poverty is really gonna be won or lost in what happens in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we think there's really a need to sort of renew an emphasis and focus on um, poverty uh, mitigating uh, programs in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. And poverty is not just in income. There's other aspects of poverty, which um, we'd like you to talk about, the multidimensional aspects of poverty and how we can, or how you researchers at the World Bank are measuring that or looking at that. Sure, um, okay, so um, yeah, indeed. So uh, poverty takes many different forms and, and many different shapes in, in different countries, and there are many different ways in which people can be um, deprived. And we've always have sort of argued that our core measure, this measure of consumption, 
is in fact a multidimensional measure because it's capturing the many different dimensions of the types of food that we eat, but also clothing, it captures shelter, it captures health expenditures and education expenditures in many cases. And so it does capture sort of many dimensions of, of well-being in that case. And yet even that consumption measure will miss things that aren't essentially priced in the market. So there are many things like um, um, uh, access to education or access to um, uh, health services or security in a country that, that are not included necessarily in, these multi, in this consumption measure of poverty. And so many different uh, institutions in the world have aimed to try to produce a measure of poverty that incorporate these multi, multiple dimensions of poverty. And we've contributed to that uh, effort by focusing on a measure that at, at its center has consumption, but then looks at non-consumption dimensions of well-being as well. Should, what do you think, should all countries of the world measure poverty based on the same line? So uh, the easiest answer to that question is, is that um, the, country, the problems that each and every country face are, are very different. And so how they think about poverty, how they conceptualize poverty, how they measure poverty should be different because they need to address very specific problems of their, of their country. And so to help them then best focus their efforts, they really do need different, um, different measures and different lines for their national policies. And so that's why I mentioned earlier that when we work in countries, we really do focus on the national priorities and how they define um, national poverty in those cases. And this notion of defining global poverty is really trying to answer a, a different type of question. So how does your research um, and your work on the poverty line feed into the overall work of the World Bank? So I think it, it helps to uh, countries and it helps our colleagues to identify sort of key bottlenecks in terms of, uh, of progress in reducing poverty. It helps um, people to identify essentially, it helps people to answer questions like, are we on track? to eliminating poverty by 2030, because mm -hmm. we can monitor poverty in a way that's comparable over time. And so we can try to look at forecasts of whether or not things are in a way that's comparable over time to try to answer that question of, has progress been adequate to eliminate poverty? Or where and what regions of the world do we need to focus more attention to reach that goal? Mm -hmm. And what interests you personally most about this work? I mean, are you, um, you're a researcher, right? You're, and you, you're an economist? Correct, An yes. economist, okay. Yep. So tell us what, what, what inspires you about this work. Well, as, as with many people that uh, we've heard from today on Econathon, what gets us most excited is when we're working with our colleagues in, in country. And, and, and that's the same with me. Um, when I'm dealing with my colleagues in national statistical offices in particular, that's who I primarily work with. And when I'm able to sort of go in there and help them to think about better ways to communicate more effectively with, with their citizens. And, and, and by that I really mean, how can they define and create better surveys that allow them to get a better picture of what's happening to poor people or what's happening to the, their population to help them elicit useful and uh, accurate information in a way that they can then create better policy. And that's, that's what gets me excited about the work. We've got about a minute and a half or so, um, and you touched on the, the, um, the national agencies. I, I know that there's a gap in the data that's coming in. Can you talk quickly about that and what we're doing maybe to uh, bridge that gap or work on, on fixing that gap? So, what we know about poverty in the world. Yeah, so I think a, a really uh, challenging question for, for um, the world, really, is to try to get a more accurate picture of, of, um, of the status of poverty. And one dimension in which we need a more um, accurate picture is just in timeliness. So we, we, these surveys that are out in the field give us snapshots of what's happening in their countries. But by the time that data gets processed and is analyzed, it's oftentimes two, three, four, five years old sometimes. And so part of our picture of global poverty is informed by data that is 
very old. And so we need to think much more strategically about how do we get quicker information out to policymakers so that they can better understand how to address things in a changing world. Thank you so much, Dean, for your um, expertise, for sharing it here today. And we have to turn to a, another topic. Um, it's another big topic. We are turning to the blue economy. How do we better understand and manage the sustainability of our oceans? And how is the health of our oceans linked to development today? Before we discuss this issue, here's a video for you to watch. The Caribbean Sea is a lifeline for millions of people. They depend on its health for food security, jobs, and livelihoods. Tourism generated $57 billion, 15% of GDP in 2017. Yet, this ocean wealth is under threat. Decades ago, many Caribbean beaches and seashores were pristine. And now, waves of plastic waste often wash up on the shoreline, especially after a big storm. 80% of marine pollution comes from land. Entire marine ecosystems and the natural assets that these countries depend on are being undermined by marine pollution, which includes plastics, sewage, agricultural runoff, and oil. Caribbean small island nations are particularly vulnerable. Marine pollution directly affects their economies and livelihoods. It decreases tourism while also affecting human health. Climate change is creating even more pressure on people and their communities. This amplifies the impact of marine pollution and the urgency to support healthy oceans. The Caribbean region is among the first to move toward a blue economy a pathway to help these countries drive sustainable growth, while also protecting marine and coastal resources. For many countries, reducing marine pollution, and especially plastics, is a top priority. And we are back at the Econathon to talk about the blue economy. I am here with Karen Kemper, who is the World Bank's Senior Director, Global Director for Environment, Natural Resources, and the Blue Economy, which I want you to explain to us what do you mean by blue economy. It's a relatively new term, so break that down for us, if you will. <laughs> okay. Hi, Danny, but really nice to be here at the Econathon. Um, the blue economy is uh, really the combination of all of the ocean sectors combined that can go from fisheries to shipping to um, coastal tourism, everything we use the ocean for in an economic sense, and to underlay that with sustainability, a sustainable use and an integrated use of the oceans, and that is the blue economy. So what is coming from the ocean? What, mm -hmm. How does the ocean affect the economy? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we measure that, actually? I know there's some work going on at the World Bank to do that. Can you explain that? Well, the, um, there's a lot of things that the ocean does for um, us uh, people on land. And uh, that is everything from uh, fishing. Uh, to, for instance, uh, the uh, protein that it provides. There are estimates that it provides um, to about 3.8 um, billion people, the average of 20% of their animal protein uh, 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 per day. So you can see that it is really very important for us. The other thing that it provides is um, the nurseries for all those fish that is in the coral reefs. Then we have shipping. Uh, most people don't know that about 90% of all goods are shipped on the oceans. It's not on planes, it's not on trains, it's on the oceans. And then you probably also like beaches, so there's uh, lots of people who want to do coastal tourism and it creates uh, jobs in the coastal economies and in that sense also uh, provides all these services in the economy. So there's a lot that it does. So what is the state of the what are what what is happening with the ocean right now what mm -hmm. what is the picture 
look like? So that is a little bit where our ocean accounts come in because we are trying to um, account for these economic activities that the ocean provides to us. And we've done quite a lot of work at the bank to do that. Our report of the changing wealth of nations will have that explicitly included next year and that's where we can show it. But at the same time, as your question implies, the oceans are pretty much on the brink. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, we have a lot of overfishing going on. So in the last uh, years, we have gone to about um, from 10% to roughly a third of all fish are overfished. And another um, of some 60% uh, actually are at exactly the sustainability level. So if we fish anything more, then it will be overfished too. And so there's just a little bit of 7% that's, um, that's underfished. So that is something that we could actually address. We have in our sunken billions report, um, which is a very, very popular one, we show that um, we squander some $80 billion a year worldwide because we are overfishing. If we fished 44% uh, less, we would actually triple the fish and we could fish more. It's a little bit counterintuitive and that is something to work on. So those are the uh, things that we look on look at in terms of what's happening to the oceans. That is compounded by climate change. The oceans are warming. We've lost about um, half of our coral reefs in the last uh, 30 years. We've got coastal erosion issues in a number of places, including in uh, West Africa. So there's a lot going on that is bringing the oceans to a tipping point. And what are some of the innovative initiatives that the World Bank is is working on to help address this? Mm -hmm. So we are um, uh, working in three different ways. One is of course uh, through our investments and our financial products. So one of the things that we are doing is we work with countries along the West African coast to help manage erosion in a lot of ways. That is both on the technical side and the investment side in infrastructure, but but also on the social side. How do people cope with such erosion when their houses go away? And when you look at the ocean and you say, oh, look, my house used to be down there and you just see an ocean surface. So you need to work with people also. The other thing we do is, for instance, we have worked with the Seychelles government to help them issue a blue bond. It was the first time ever that a sovereign country has actually been able to attract funds from investors by issuing a blue bond and we worked with them to get their underlying uh, governance right to um, help them with marine protected areas so that investors could say well we really believe that the Seychelles are managing their blue economy in their oceans well and we will invest in that so these are a couple of examples of things that we do in order to uh, to help countries but also drive innovation and I know too there's a new fund called pro blue mm -hmm. Um, tell us about that. Um, that is a fund that we have um, set up in partnership with a range of um, uh, development partners, donors, and that is a fund that I personally hope will um, really stimulate this type of investments and additional knowledge that we need in order to tackle these challenges that I was talking about. And uh, at the moment it's a rough $150 million, and what we do with it is we help countries to develop investment projects in uh, to develop new uh, studies and analytical work to better understand what they can do um, and uh, then to catalyze that in more funding either uh, through the World Bank or through other funding their own funding or other partners because what we feel is that the urgency on the oceans is so strong that there needs to be more investment much more investments and that's what we want to do with that fund and it needs to be innovative investment. Give, give an example of what um, kind of investment that mm -hmm. might be to change things. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Give a concrete, concrete example. Of well, well one, one topic I haven't talked about um, is marine plastics, for instance, mm. which is another one of these challenges. So you could imagine uh, a type of investment where we help countries or a country to um, take care of uh, number one of its solid waste because most uh, waste and plastic waste that um, goes into the oceans comes from land. So you have to deal with your waste based on land, with your incentive systems, with your regulation, with your governance system on land. Uh, we are working, for instance, with the government of Indonesia to, um, uh, to uh, um, implement this type of activities. And uh, through that way, they will be able to st stave off the flow of plastics into the ocean, but they will also have on land health benefits, municipal benefits, and actually to, to come back to the to the um, blue economy, they will also have competitiveness benefits because um, investors like to invest in well-managed places. So there's a lot of benefits that they get from that type of investment. So that would be one example. And um, going back to the plastics in, in the ocean, uh, it get gets a lot of attention in the media. How bad is that problem? And what? And again, what what are we doing about it? What can someone so, watching do about uh -huh, that if yes. they care? About about the oceans, yes. what advice would you give mm -hmm. to um, those of us mm -hmm. not working at the World Bank, um, students, anyone watching? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a lot we could do. I hope we have two hours to talk about it. No, we have five but, minutes, uh, <laughs> like about four minutes, <laughs> <Okay>. actually. <laughs> so, so, so um, the the um, it is pretty bad. There are estimates that many people have heard of, and that I find are the most visual ones. That is, that if we continue the way we are acting now, by 2050 we will have as much um, plastic in the ocean by volume as fish, and that is. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that I think no one really wants. Oh. Uh, now, on the one hand, that is on the aesthetic side. Obviously, we wouldn't want that. But what no one really knows at this moment is how that um, plastic degrades in the oceans, what it does to the food chain, and what it ultimately would do to human beings when we eat the degraded plastic that we have as an intake. So that is a certain concern. And uh, there's a lot of people who are really trying to stave off ocean plastic. So you say, what would a viewer do who sees this conversation? Um, well, I see that you are um, using a water glass. That is a great thing to do, because uh, one of the key problems is single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. um, going, getting your coffee cup, um, throwing it away, getting a bottle, throwing it away. It has to go somewhere, and many times it just goes from a little stream into a bigger stream, and the stream goes to the ocean and that's where you then can find it. So that would be the one first biggest thing that everybody could do and eliminate single-use plastics. You heard what she said, <laughs> so do it. Um, what are some of the most exciting things on the horizon for you and your work mm -hmm. coming um, up? There's uh, an, a number of um, things. One, it's uh, it just started, so it's almost on the horizon <laughs> uh, in the sense that it's sort of just is there. And that is a um, an activity that we have in the Caribbean. It is a an insurance mechanism that is called COAST. And it is a specific insurance mechanism for fisher folk. So every time that you have a hurricane, there are um, rebuilt activities there are also certain insurance uh, schemes that are including the bank uh, um, uh, piloted and um, uh, started up some 10 years ago but fisher folk specifically were not targeted so this insurance mechanism that we have will it's parametric and it will permit a payout specifically to fisher folk because they lose their boats they lose their nets and sometimes there's a big shift in how the beach are, how you can take your boats out and so on, and so they get impaired for a very long time. So that insurance mechanism is, we just launched it um, on, uh, on July 1st with a range of partners, and um, we really hope that that will make a difference in the Caribbean, and then maybe also other small island states, for instance, or other coastal areas. I love how you gave an example of how 
concrete our work here at the World Bank is and how specific and how close we're working with countries and with uh, the private sector as well. Um, la just to close this out, because we've got about a minute or two, um, what inspires you most about this work? Uh, well, what inspires me most about this blue work, the blue economy work, is that when I was a child and I first met the ocean, I really, really thought that it was um, endless, it was huge. And so to me it was a shock when I realized how it was in a way becoming smaller and smaller because we were filling it with more and more things such as plastics or using too much of it and the impact that humans can have on it. So what inspires me is to get in the sustainability into ocean work so that it continues to be endless. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for this conversation, which um, we are going to stop for now. Um, and if you want to learn more about the World Bank's work in uh, Pro Blue and the blue economy, just go online and you will find it. So thank you, Karen. We, I, I'm at the end of the hour here. It went by so fast. We spoke about so many amazing things, women's economic empowerment, um, Poverty Line and the Blue Economy. Thank you again, Karen. I'm going to turn to Shri. Um, you are next. Great. So tell us what's going on. Thank you so much, Danny. It's going to be a great hour. We're going to be talking about how to measure the impact of the work we do in development. We're going to talk about taxes and we're going to talk about MEGA. What does that stand for? Tune in and you'll find out. All right, so I've had a great time here at the Econathon. I'm passing the ball over to you, Shri. Thank you, Danny. It is uh, almost 8 o'clock here in Washington, D.C., so over to you. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.